Welcome back, guys. Business Untitled. You know, a lot of people told me that I cuss a lot on here. And I want to repent and stop cussing. Everyone cusses, but you know what really hit me was my friend, my one of my really, really good friends, Antonil. I won't say his last name, but he's just as hood as I am, just as smart as I am, probably smarter in a lot of ways. And he said to me, he said, yo, you know, everybody curse on the show, but when you curse, it just hit different. And coming from him, a lot of people told me, but coming from him, who I was like, is just like me, it hit me different. And I was like, you know what? I got to stop cursing. Fuck, I got to stop cursing. <laughs> but we created a swear jar. And the swear jar, I, I don't think we have an amount that we put in it. We put 20, it's a couple hundreds in here. But we're going to fold this. Everybody who cusses on the show, and including myself, Mike, Dave, we're going to fold this. And hopefully this will be worth four to five thousand dollars because there's no amount it's no dollar amount that we put in there we just put money in our pocket one lucky subscriber is gonna get picked and they're gonna get this five thousand dollars and get up we're gonna you know what i'm gonna add some shit to it the shit count yes. shit <laughs> so more money for the swear jar and our guys in the back are added up and we put it in every day um we're going to fly that person to us if they're not in New York, and we're going to give them the swear jar on the show, and they're going to get a chance to meet us. So hopefully this thing will have $5,000. Shout out to my boy, Antonio. Well, we're back again. Business Untitled. Episode... You know what? We did so many episodes, I'm losing track of it. But our guy just said 20. Wow, 20 episodes. This is so dope that we somehow <laughs> made it to 20 episodes. <laughs> but, Mike, you're on Forbes again in a big way. And Bitcoin exploded. What's happening? I think it exploded because I was on Forbes. Are you rich again? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Listen, you know, this has been a uh, it's been a great quarter for Bitcoin, a great month for Bitcoin, a great month for crypto. Uh, why is it happening? It's really kind of simple. The ETF, you know, got launched. And, you know, when it first came out, there were people that had front ran the ETF. There were people that were nervous about the ETF. Uh, and so price went up, price went down, and all of a sudden, the people that had to sell have sold, and there's just new buyers coming in every day, and you can see it every single day. You can add up the nine different ETFs, and it's $400 million more million in the space, $500 million more million in the space. I learned early on from my friend Paul Tudor Jones that prices are set on the margin. What I mean by that is, like, if there are 10 buyers and 10 sellers, and all of a sudden two more buyers come, it drives the price it's up until they're sellers. And so it's asymmetric. It doesn't mean you can get a billion, two billion, ten billion of market cap in a day or in a week with far less buying than that, yeah. right? And so you saw it in NVIDIA, uh, who had a day where it went up $240 billion in one day. Uh, wow. And we're seeing it in, in, in crypto right now. And it feels like this momentum is picking up, not slowing down. Uh, we're at 54,000 today. If you look on the charts, it's not going to go in a direct line, but it will get to 69,000, the old high. At that point, it probably pauses, maybe comes back. Everyone takes some profit, and then it's going to keep going higher. And so this is the year for crypto, baby. Can, can you talk talk about the ETFs a little bit more? You know, exchange-traded funds, why is that it's so important in this context? Yeah, so if you're young, if you're Gen Z, millennial, and you wanted to buy Bitcoin, you have probably bought it on Robinhood or through your Square app, uh, on Coinbase. PayPal, Coinbase, Gemini. There have been so many places to buy it. But the bulk of the wealth in America, a giant amount, $45 trillion, is owned by baby boomers. Wow. People people that are 50, well, unfortunately, 59 you know, to, <laughs> to, to 75, 80. They own the money. They own the money for a bunch of reasons. They were there when the, the, the markets went up. They have the biggest amount of people. That's why they call the baby boomers. Uh, and they're old, right? You 
accumulate more assets as you get old. They do their buying and selling through what we used to call stockbrokers. Barry Bayer yeah, yeah, yeah. spent his whole career as a yeah. stockbroker, right? You talk to, to wealthy people and tell them what you think they should buy and sell. Uh, they're called registered investment advisors. And right now, their, their weapon of choice is the ETF. The ETF is basically taking a commodity or an asset and making it just as easy as a stock to buy. So they've taken Bitcoin and say, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you just need to buy this ETF, which is a stock. So you call your stockbroker, you can get leverage on it. He just picks up the phone and there's no new account set up. You don't worry about custody, all the stuff that felt like voodoo to old people. Felt like very easy to understand mm -hmm. to young people. And so all these old people are starting to buy crypto. And their brokers are saying, just put one or 2% of your portfolio in. But that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money when you're talking 45 so, trillion. And, and wow. talk about like, so Bitcoin is in an ETF, what about, say, Ethereum, right? The next biggest one, or Solana. How come Bitcoin's in one and Solana well, and Ethereum are Bitcoin, aren't because it, 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 it's the first brand. Uh, I always say it's maybe the best brand that's been created on this planet in the last 100 years. Uh, the fastest, right? I mean, it's whatever, 14 years old and, uh, you know, over a trillion dollars of, of market cap, and it's known around the world. It's got now 250 million people that own some piece of a Bitcoin. Uh, ETF for Ethereum is coming. It's been filed. Uh, one of the reasons Ethereum has had such a good run recently, right? It's gone from 2000 to 3100 is people are anticipating, hey, that's next. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there'll be more and more ETFs down the road. It's going to start with Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it wouldn't surprise me if Solana has an ETF at one point. Right. <clears throat> Did you just say four or five trillion dollars when you said they're putting one percent of people are saying put one percent? Their brokers are saying put one percent. No, you if, said if, that's, if, if you have forty five trillion, of forty five trillion, ten percent is four and a half trillion. One percent would be four hundred fifty billion. Okay, so that was my question. I was uh, I thought you said forty five trillion, but I said that would be crazy. But you did say forty five trillion. Forty five trillion. So one, they're putting one percent of forty five trillion, which is four or five trillion dollars, no, right? It's four hundred fifty billion. So okay, okay, four hundred and fifty billion. And is that controlled by the baby boomers? Forty five trillion, or you're just saying? Yeah, forty five trillion is controlled by baby boomers. Which is people over fifty years old. Sixty. It's over sixty years old. Yeah. So forty five trillion dollars is controlled by people that are over sixty years old. Yeah. We should double check that number so I'm not you know I, I, run I, out, but I think that's the right number. Someone Google that. That's <laughs> try not to cuss. So but our, that is crazy. Right. Listen, America has a lot of wealth. Yeah. We're the wealthiest country on the planet. Uh, the average American, I think, average American wealth is around four hundred and twenty five. Uh, $450,000. So every family, that's, that means after the debt, right? So you take your real estate and your stocks and your cash and your art minus your mortgage and your other debt. Your, that's your net wealth. And, you know, for America, that's a pretty high number. So let me, let me ask this, right? So Ethereum, Solana coming. Part of it is because Bitcoin is considered not a security, correct? So right. it's not a security. That's why they're, right? Ethereum, that ruling has not been made yet, right? Not happened. Talk about that a Gary little Gary Gensler, bit. before he was at the yeah. SEC, said Ethereum is definitely not a security. Uh, since he's been at the SEC, he said, we're not so sure. Right. And Why is this important? Well, it's important because we've got arcane laws in America, right, from the 1940s uh, that define what's a security and what's not a security. And if you're not a security, the SEC doesn't regulate you. You're regulated if you're a commodity by the CFTC. If you're a security, you get registered, regulated by the, the SEC. And how things are launched, how, how money is raised, uh, is really governed by that. And so because a lot of this, these tokens happened before we had a regulatory framework, you're not positive what's a security and not, what's not a security. And so you can get in big trouble if you're the issuer mm -hmm. or at times even the, the bank that participates buying and selling mm -hmm. in things that are unregistered securities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of – I, I would actually pay the fine, but I'm not going to curse. Uh, it's, been, it's been BS that our Congress and our SEC and our CFTC haven't gotten together and passed laws to make it clearer – for you, for me, for businesses mm -hmm. like mine, you know, what the rules are. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of guessing what we think the rules are. And, and you know, some companies like Coinbase have been really uh, aggressive in saying, you guys, 
these are what we think the rules are, and we're going to play by them, and we don't care what you think. Mm -hmm. We'll sue you. You can sue mm -hmm. us, we'll sue you back. Mm -hmm. uh, other companies have been more conservative. But it's made it really, really challenging. And I think the SEC's worry about declaring Ethereum a secure, uh, uh, not a security is it opens up the door for lots of other what's called proof of stake tokens yeah, to yeah, say, well, we're yeah. just like that. Like, right. what's the rule now? Yeah. Uh, and so it's a slippery slope until we get Congress to, to set guidelines. Mm -hmm. I do sense. think that will happen at the end of the after the election. Mm -hmm. So, correction, 78, some, as somebody just told me, $78 trillion is controlled by baby boomers. $78 trillion. Which is half the wealth of the country, right? Right. So, how does that... I, I, the, the 45 might be non-real estate. Yeah. Whatever, 45, right. 78... How does that, for Gen Z or for anyone else, I don't want to say feel fair, but what, what do you do? Just kind of wait for your parents to die? Like, yes. Yeah, but let me, let me say something, first of all. Like, compounding interest says that if I start investing when I'm 21 years old and it's 60 years later, I'm going to have a lot of money. I'm yeah. going to have a lot more money than, like, a 25-year-old that's only been investing for four years. So there is a part of it where naturally, right, yeah. in Old this people world. people should be richer than you. Yeah, in, in this world. I no, mean, no, and, no. And, and I, we don't have earning capacity anymore either. So the other side of that is <clears throat> making sure that there's enough wealth in you know, you know, old people to take care of themselves, retire, et cetera, things like that. So that's part of why there's so, so much is it that wealth up We there. are about to enter the single greatest wealth transfer in the history of planet Earth. As baby boomers die off, and they mm -hmm. will die, one thing that is sure, everybody dies. Uh, that wealth is going to get shifted to millennials and Gen Z. And so, you know, in some ways, <laughs> you're, you're with your boss. <laughs> Come on, Grandpa. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's the reality of it, right? Charlie Munger just died at what was well, close to 100 years yeah, old. Yeah. He had $40 billion. That, that money's going somewhere. He's not taking it to heaven with him. Right. So, so... Odds are you're going to say Ethereum is going to be, you know, effectively ETF. They're going to say yep. it's a commodity, not a security. It's decentralized enough, and and the Ethereum and argument is a little bit up level one, a little bit challenging tokens. because the reason Bitcoin was able to become an ETF was because there was already a futures ETF approved. Right, and and Bitcoin, I think it's very hard to say it's like centralized and controlled by one party, right? Like there's a test for securities. Yeah, I forget the Howey test. The Howie test. Yeah, or whatever it is. And so Ethereum, it gets onto a slippier, more slippery slope. But anyway, you, uh, market says you think that Ethereum will get to that same treatment, basically. Yeah. Talk about level ones in general, about why is Bitcoin even different than Ethereum? As long as we're on crypto, let's just do a real quick primer on it. Yeah, listen, like, so... In general, each of these ecosystems are a story. They're a narrative. Uh, the Bitcoin narrative that came first was we're going to be the first decentralized money. And I'm going to bring people into my community who believe the story I'm telling. Right? The, the value of Bitcoin doesn't come from this ma amazing technology. That's a necessary part of it. But it comes from the social construct that you and I trust each other, that we can say, hey, I believe this has value and you believe it has value, therefore it has value. And we're going to trust this decentralized system of cryptography uh, that once we say it, it's actually, uh, in essence, the Constitution is built into the code. Um, Ethereum has its own code and its own Constitution and its own community. Uh, and all of these other blockchains, which are, in essence, a version, all a version of the same thing. It's a shared database that a community comes around and says, hey, this database is important to us. They all have a story of what they're going to be used for. Mm -hmm. Most of the level ones say, we want to be the supercomputer uh, that processes and stores all your data because we think we can store data faster and more fair and more equitable uh, than the companies right now that are storing data, which are usually governments or Facebook or these big siloed governments or, or siloed actors that can manipulate, own, and keep your data, right? During COVID, the Canadians said, hey, if you're a trucker protesting uh, uh, the, the, the vax mandates and you're blocking, we're going to freeze your checking accounts. You're like, you can't freeze my money. Like, oh, yeah, we can, right? They had access to that data. Mm -hmm. uh, in India, uh, Modi decided, yeah, the guys up in Kashmir really pissed me off. He literally erased 9 million people 
from the country's database. So you guys no longer exist. Well, India is the first country that has a centralized digital ID for everybody. So if you want to get your benefits, uh, you need your ID number. Uh, oh, someone just stole my ID number. Uh, from something as simple as a college transcript, right? Like at one point, you know, people lie about their transcripts. You call the university. Hey, did that guy really get all A's? Oh, no, no. He was a C student. Oh. Yeah. You know, that's all going to be in a blockchain. Even though right. we trust our universities, yeah. they're probably not going to lie. Why, why do I have to trust them when it could all be put on a blockchain? Right. And so theoretically, yeah. all these blockchains can be used to guard, store, uh, and protect our data. Yeah. And yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, that's the narrative that they all sell. Yeah, I, I think one thing that you have to keep in mind is in the United States, there is a lot of trust in institution, pretty much, right? You don't think your bank's going to wipe you out, your university's yeah, not going to wipe you down, out. Yeah, but it's breaking down. Like <clears throat> it is breaking down. But I'm saying, if you're in another country, if you're in <clears throat> Venezuela, if you're in Argentina, if you're in, you know, China, right? There's a lot of other places where that trust doesn't exist. So, so having this system, right, this eventually se self-executing okay. system. Uh, is you can look at the security. price of Bitcoin, which was created in 2009 after the financial Who crisis. Who was it created by? Satoshi Nakamoto. Is that really true or that's a myth? Or does anyone know if that's no true or it's a myth? There, somebody created it and, and, and put this constitution, this white paper. In okay, the so ecosystem. who was Ether created by? A guy named Vitalik Buterin. Solano. Uh, Solano. Uh, Anatoly. Anatoly. So every single one of these blockchains any cryptocurrency we know exactly who created other it, than bitcoin other than bitcoin is there not like a, a a worry somewhere that someone created it has the keys for it right well, so there's a, there's a thing called the the take it or the manipulate gen, it when Genesis it becomes strong block, enough. right satoshi's wallet has a gigantic amount of bitcoin and there was always the fear he might sell it i personally think the keys were lost. Satoshi died. He's never wanted it because there's no way you could be patient enough to sit on that big of a of a <laughs> of a stack and not sell any. What if it's China? <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying you so don't the, know. No the, one knows. Well, the people there are people that were around at the beginning, right? And so one of my classmates from Princeton was one of the guys who Satoshi trusted a bunch of things with. They're guys that started mining, and so there was a community of people that were participating. Remember, this was small fry stuff. Yeah. Small fry stuff. Why there's some people that are worth a hundred million, a billion, five billion, ten billion that never you never heard of? It's because they started mining Bitcoin when it was twenty five cents, thirty right. cents, a dollar. I got friends that are worth billions of dollars because they bought Bitcoin when it was two dollars. Yeah. Right? I bought it at a hundred dollars. Uh, people have bought it at a thousand. It's now fifty four thousand two hundred dollars. So imagine if you bought it at thirty seven cents. So there's no to, to answer the question. There's no, there's no worry. No, I, I, obviously I'm joking with that. But there's no worry that because you don't actually know who has the keys for it, it's kind of a myth who has the keys well, for it. Well, if, if there was a Satoshi sitting on that pile, all he could do was say, "Okay, I'm going to sell my Bitcoin." Yeah. He couldn't change the ecosystem. Right. Okay. Yeah, I that's know. that's what's important to understand. It just means yeah. some guy may or may not have a hundred billion and dollars. And what's or, most likely it, you know. is that though, that Bitcoin is is in essence gone for good. It just sits there. No, no one's going to do anything with it. Like you think there's estimates that of the 21 million Bitcoin, right, 19 and a half million have already been mined, that there's two to three million that were just lost, right? What it was yeah. 37 cents. You put it on your freaking computer. Your computer breaks. Right. You're not even worried about it. There's guy. There's stories of guys literally have spent millions of dollars going through dumps because the guys. I, I had all this Bitcoin on my computer and I threw my computer away. And uh, I mean, we've got guys that yeah. come into our office and beg us to help get it off their treasures or their computers because they forgot their passwords or codes. Who's the most you know a guy personally lost in Bitcoin that just can't access it? A couple million bucks. Crazy, yeah. but the system itself is very transparent, secure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. That's that's the. But I was just wondering if I mean, that was a possibility. It's a, the, it's a I, fair question. Yeah, Bitcoin was really created, right? In specific, I think there's a lot of confusion around this thing of cryptocurrency because it was created kind of with the money supply. Bitcoin in was created mind. as the first decentralized money. Right. And so, if you read the Bitcoin white paper, it literally is an economic paper. Yes. Um, when Vitalik Buterin, who is this genius. I actually, he's my hero of the entire space. He is such an ethical dude. He's the first guy that's po post money. He doesn't care about money. He could, he could 
launch a project tomorrow and take billions and he just doesn't care about the money. He cares about the revolution. So he looked at Bitcoin and said, oh my God, this is an amazing technological breakthrough and an amazing sociological breakthrough. But the Bitcoin code and the way it's structured doesn't really work to be decentralized everything. So he added a thing called a smart contract onto a blockchain and created Ethereum to be much more adaptable to be able to not just have zeros and ones and money on your on your blockchain, but to have code, to have photos, to have anything you want, to have contract law, to have. And so his vision was, we're going to have this decentralized database, the decentralized supercomputer that everything gets built on. Right. And that's really why I got excited about this revolution. I would not have spent the last 12 years of my life in crypto if it was just because we're creating a casino yeah. or we're creating a new monetary system. Yeah. Yeah. And the monetary system is pretty cool with Bitcoin, but the real revolution comes to, and it hasn't happened yet, right? right. So far, Bitcoin has happened. NFTs, to a degree, that they came and went, they got a little too speculative. Payments, right? All around the world, people are moving around dollars, U.S. dollar, you know, s synthetic dollars, USDC or Tether on different blockchains, right? The number one blockchain for payments right now, shockingly enough, is a blockchain called Tron. Uh, and people use Tether on Tron all over Africa, all over the Mideast to move money so, around. But it hasn't happened in the stuff that we thought the revolution would, in music, in, yeah. in ticketing, in decentralized ride sharing, in lots Listen, of other parts of now, finance. You, back it up for a second because I don't think you've like put the leap together, right? Like just talk about Ethereum for one second, right? It's like basically like a protocol, so to speak, right? That you can build smart contracts yes. and launch any business on. In theory, you can do that with Bitcoin, but it was created for like this single purpose, basically like a monetary system. So it's not as smart as an Ethereum system in that context. But I think what what is missing about the narrative sometimes in the public is everyone thinks of it all as cryptocurrency, which puts them in this casino mindset effectively. And it well, doesn't allow that, you, it doesn't allow you to like basically recognize the actual utility of the blockchain. And that's a problem with but, the but narrative. One of the, one of the, the things that I think is interesting is, so when I started selling Bitcoin and then Ethereum, and when I say selling, I was kind of like a, a preacher, like trying to explain to people and get them excited. I really believed that Bitcoin would be the only crypto that would have value as a store of value. When you look at the periodic table of elements, there's 114 elements. Uh, gold is the only one that has value because it's got value. Scarce. scarce. The rest are also scarce, need a utility for people to care about them, right? We use copper for all kinds of things. That's why people buy copper. They don't buy copper just to hold it. And so my original thesis was, and I think in the long run, this will probably hold true, was that Ethereum needs its own utility and it's got one. And every crypto was going to need some utility, right? We saw Uniswap, which is this decentralized exchange jump in value because finally it's paying out some of the profits from commissions that people use. But that was a utility. It's creating this unbelievable exchange where you can, you can trade anything, not just cryptos, but at one point you'll be able to trade anything. And so, but what's happened is because of the way crypto works, the more people that buy your token, the higher the price goes, the more you get excited about it. You've got a, an incentive to get other people involved and tell that story. We've had lots of different crypto ecosystems that fight with each other that all have some store of value to them, right? Dogecoin is still a $10 trillion dollar Ten trillion. I mean, I'm sorry. Ten billion dollar ecosystem, yeah. Yeah. because it's crazy. it because the people that buy it care about it in the same way the people that buy it, a lot smaller than Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's a trillion one, and but there's there's currencies like Cardano, yeah. which the guy Charles Hoskinson, he was one of the Ethereum guys, and he spun out and did his own, and his team is passionate about what Cardano is going to be used for. I don't think Cardano will be used for much, yeah, but it well, still has a lot of value, and so. We've debased, we've debased, uh, it's like meme stocks. We've debased what people think of value. Gen Z and millennials think very differently about what they want to own. And so you've got what I would have thought would have been crazy passion and crazy valuations around lots of tokens that 
don't really have a utility yet. They might have a utility in the future, and they have a story of utility, but they have no utility yet. Well, I, I think the the narrative has been dominated by like the casino aspect of this, not the utility aspect of this. And so even when you put Doge, for instance, in the same breath as Ethereum or Solana, right? It, it doesn't deserve to be in the same breath. It's speculative. It has no functionality. The founders themselves admit that it has no functionality. I'm saying Dogecoin, mm -hmm. right? And so what I think confuses the public about this to an extent is they can't figure out the difference between like utility versus speculation in the tokens. Wow. And so everybody puts all this, lumps all this stuff into one yeah. bucket, and it's not one bucket. And it's, some and of this it, stuff it, will be Amazon, and some of this stuff will be Pets.com. What, what surprising to me is how resilient these other ecosystems have been, right? Why do you think that is? Is it just because of we got eight billion storytelling people. and community building? We've got eight billion people on the planet. If you go back and read, you know, Yuval Harari and Sapiens, we are a, you know, Homo Sapiens are people of stories, yeah. and these are interesting stories. And and now I've got a vested interest. Well, so let's talk about if we're going to talk about use case on crypto, right? I'm going to switch on it, but but Supreme Court today took. Two cases, one out of Texas, one out of Florida, right? Basically, with the with with that issue, whether the states can regulate social media, the content of social media. Both Texas and Florida passed laws that said that Facebook, YouTube are not allowed to moderate content. Um, that they they must allow views to be expressed. They can't. Uh, moderate by location, they can't moderate by views, etc. And it's a really complicated question because when these laws protecting social media were passed, like Section 230, we talked about it another time, um, you know, it was 30 years ago, so the internet was very different. And so this idea of like, and I'm going to get to why it's, why it's, I think, a little bit interesting regarding crypto, but these networks have such power now and what started out as this is kind of a game or it's just sharing picture files or what have you is now like dominating democracy. It's dominating information. It's really like gating access. It's gating money basically on what those algorithms are, right? So the structure of that network and the network effect power of Facebook, of YouTube, Google is immense. It's impenetrable. And so when you look at the NASDAQ, you look at the valuations, five companies basically have all five, six, seven Which companies. Which five companies? Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Would you say these five you companies know, or six or seven, whatever it is, is as powerful or more powerful than the government or some governments? Because I have a friend now, he says, right, he always says this to me. He said, the world is so different and the people at the top don't realize it. The world isn't run from the top down anymore. It's run from the bottom up, which means social media controls the narrative of what has to be changed in a sense or what has to be yeah the voice and, that's and who, can, and who as controls as that but, right, yeah. but and who controls social media the, the bottom mark Z well the mark top. zuckerberg controls top. meta that's controlled elon, by five or six elon guys. controls twitter right uh i'll tell so, you okay, okay so let me just go on this for one second somebody talk more about so, that so what i'm saying is because what, it, wait, yeah. wait the only thing i want to add to that yeah. is and i want to break this down for myself right yeah, maybe yeah. all the viewers yep. get it but i don't get yeah. it right because when you say it's controlled by six or seven guys yep. i'm thinking i'm using my phone putting up a post and i went viral and now i'm controlling something so right. are you saying that these five or six guys in these companies, or maybe it's bots, maybe so, it's whatever, even could make me think that I am pushing a narrative that they pushed on me that yeah, that one hundred percent. I don't even understand the narrative yeah. that I'm pushing yeah. because no, you know number, yeah, I, no, maybe I'm not saying it right. No, but, yeah, you I are. understand what you're saying. Number one, yes, they're influencing your thoughts, right? But but second, I'm saying like, can you, you touch on that a little bit? Well, it's like, I got a great example. Yeah, yeah, go on. So listen, you know, this is going to be sensitive and I'm going to get yelled at for saying this. Uh, October uh, 7th. 7th, right? Hamas attacks Israel, horrible terrorist attack. And normal reaction would have been like, oh, my God, look, look at this. And, and, and I flew over to Israel 10 days, 12 days afterwards and saw what happened. It was horrific. I saw the film. I visited all the kibbutz Berry. I, I went there to bear witness. And I started watching how fast the youth of America 
was changing their mind about what happened, right? There was posts that Osama bin Laden was right all along, and there was like a whole little bin Laden thing that showed up. And there was this, listen, I, it's a very complicated issue. The Palestinians have a right to be unbelievably upset. The Israelis have a right to be unbelievably upset. You know, there's no right or wrong here. But how fast the narrative shifted on social media, on TikTok especially, that this was, it felt anti-Semitic and very, very pro-Hamas. And I recently sat with a woman uh, who's a friend, who is sharp as can be, who had been the undersecretary of treasury uh, for counterterrorism. So she is not a, under Trump. So she is not a flake. Uh, she is a stone cold uh, serial killer when it comes to understanding things. And she was like, oh my goodness. TikTok, controlled by the Chinese, pushed this narrative so fast and so hard that within two weeks, every single part of the algorithm was showing this stuff. Yeah, and simple, and, stupid for me. What do you mean they pushed it? How did they push it? When, when you start scrolling and you get a story, what stories are you getting? They were they were pushing these stories of, you know, that felt anti-Semitic, that felt all the blame was on Israel, that it was, that, you know, that, that, and it created this movement. Uh, and, and she said, like, categorically this happened. And it, TikTok, in this case, was far, far worse than uh, Instagram and Facebook and the other ones. But, but effectively, it's, it's confirmation bias. It's psychological. If you get enough stuff pushed to you, like, you're going to believe that. Like, you have no idea why the moon is the moon or, you know, you just see something in the sky, right? I'm just saying, like, the, you have to learn things, right? And the more information is repeated by credible sources or just any source, you, you know, so at the end of the day, these algorithms have the ability. They're not neutral. They basically are geared to push certain information at you that you're going to like. Some of it's because they want to market to you. They want to sell to you. They want to influence you. There's a lot of reasons. And another one I'll tell you is, is there's all these creators that helped create YouTube, for instance, or helped create Instagram. But at some point in time, it's in Instagram's interest to just say, oh, we're just not going to make them as relevant anymore. There's no value. You can't take any of that value that you've created away from the network at the end of the day. I mean, this is a slightly different point. Yeah. But effectively, these networks have so much power. So if you've amassed a million followers on Instagram and then you get mad about the terms of service because they switch it or if you're trying to start a business on an app store, on Apple's app store to switch off of social media onto that and they're charging you 30% of your revenues, you really don't have another alternative. And so there's a, so getting back to that case, it's a really complicated animal what needs to be done with these networks right now, right? So states are say, starting to say, look, we don't trust that Meta or Twitter on the right or the left, whatever you want to say, is curating and moderating this content without pull either advertent or inadvertent influences, right? And so they're trying to say every piece of content has to be pushed. That's what the Texas law and the Florida law effectively say, that Meta okay, so the is, is not, yeah, sorry, Meta's not allowed to basically show you some content and hide other content based on what they think is like acceptable, right? And so yeah. there's a suit going up, which has now just been held, heard by the Supreme Court today. That's red gonna, states, conservative states think these liberal companies based in San Francisco are showing more liberal stuff, not conservative stuff. Right. So they're passing this law. Right. Places like Facebook, I think we were talking about this, have 15,000 moderate content, content moderators. moderators. Yeah. So listen, I, I, I knew the woman that left a big job in news to try to run Facebook news and make sure like people there aren't saying let's do this purposely and push fake news and not push other news. These are giant beasts that are literally like in some ways uncontrollable yeah. at this point. There's it, so I, many people participating I, on them. And I think I'll, take I, the, I'll take the switch off for this. Yeah. This is such a mind fuck, right? Because oh. e, I, I just <laughs> said I'll take the switch off. Because even for me, like it, it's 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 so weird because when I look and let's get off of Israel and Palestine for a second, but anything that's being pushed to me, right? I can't even comprehend at times. And I'm in this circle where Trump I... Trump versus Biden right now. No, no, no Trump versus Biden, right? Yeah. I'm saying for me, 
Like even with you, we were talking the other day. With, and with the bed? With the bed, right? Yeah. Tell that story real quick. Yeah, because a lot of it's commercial too. Like I was talking to somebody, somebody shared a photo with me, not on the Instagram platform, about some design inspiration for like something to do with work, like a bed or a bedroom set. And that same, in, that same photo showed up in my Instagram feed a day later, which I'm just like, I don't know what pieces came together to make that happen, but that's the control that the networks have to push to you, sometimes for just commercial purposes, other times for influence purposes. And even if it's not intentional, the fact is it's still influence. I mean, it is intentional many times. It when is it, intentional. When it, when it well, here's the, wait, wait, let me say this. Here's yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. The narrative is, right, why yeah. things go viral on Twitter. It's like we are free. So we are woke, right? And everything is, I'm woke, I'm woke, I'm woke. You can't put me to sleep anymore. But in all reality, we're so unwoke because we're being manipulated, manipulated yeah. right? Yeah. And it's hard to tell somebody who after 20 years just, said yeah. now i'm woke you can't stop yeah. me because i could post i could this i could that it's free it's freedom of speech you can't how do you it's such so, a so what, a crazy manipulation because you can't tell somebody who just discovered who think they discovered they're woke that in all reality you're not woke you're being controlled way more than you ever yeah. was in life how do you how do you even tell that story to someone who well this is how we're telling that story. I'm telling you that story yeah. right now. This is what's no going on. No one's going to believe you. Well, Florida, Texas sued, right, basically to require that twice a year, Twitter, Facebook, these big platforms, show how their algorithms work because nobody knows how it works. You know, you could say, and, and effectively, there's so much embedded mm -hmm. in embedded in this they can't be held for libel there's a you know there's a lot of technical questions around this but all we know is that they're much more important than they were ever thought to be and at this point in time it's a big giant mess effectively and like of e manipulation elon elon i believe i, I could be yeah. wrong on this he said hey, i'm going to put my algorithms open source anyone can look at my algorithms well how in god's name are you and me or dave who aren't computer programmers going to look at algorithms and understand what they are right <laughs> all i know is since he's taken over Twitter, it has become really, you know, alt-right almost. It has become really conservative, really anti-woke, uh, really. Uh, so you agree that they should. Well, I put... think they, they there's got like just opening your algorithms to open source doesn't necessarily really uh, help most users because we don't know what the, how these well, algorithms work. Yeah. Maybe they should have to explain them verbally. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what they have to do. But yeah. in, in this in this law, I'm just saying what it's doing is it's saying, and again, I, I look, it's really complicated. I can't say either it way, but, so what, but what they are saying is that they need to allow all viewpoints to be represented. They're not allowed to moderate or clip content anymore based on, now, listen, there's certain things you're not allowed to say. You're not allowed to sex traffic. You're not allowed to uh, incite violence. You're not allowed to commit criminality you can't yell, that that's fire all. in a crowd of movie yeah, theater yeah. Right? so so there's you certain exceptions the there's certain uh, exceptions to free speech okay but i'm saying like in this context i think it's a really interesting question what the supreme court's going to do with this because these networks at the end of the day they have so much power the reason i'm bringing it back to blockchain is they can change the other thing is they can change the rules on you at any time you our mail at Instagram, Mike at Instagram, Mike at Twitter, they can take it away from you. They can shadow ban you. You don't even know. Listen, we had Drea DiMatteo on here. She was saying she was shadow banned after she came out against the vaccine. She didn't even know why. She just wasn't getting any followers, wasn't getting any push. You can't see that, right? So if, you, if we flip it back to... Blockchain. Well, blockchain, yeah, because, it, you know, th there's th the first fact is these networks are incredibly powerful. Nobody knows how to regulate them or control them, and it's a concern. doesn't matter right, left, whatever. There's a lot of power in these things for commercial, political purposes, whatever. Second is like, okay, how do you solve it? One way to solve it is regulation. That's what Texas and Florida tried to do. Regulation's always tough. The governments can never catch up. It's, it's, it's just a big mess, right? Another way is to try to start a network on another platform. And I wanna make one other point, which is when emails and websites started, before anybody knew what the internet was, there was a protocol, right? HTML, HTTP, that effectively governs the distribution of websites. And so you can get a website, you pay $10 for it, 
You can move it around. Nobody's going to take it away from you. It's a really, it's, it's a protocol that's fair and, and logical and understandable in a sense. It doesn't have the same risks that a TikTok, a YouTube, a Google, you know, places like that do, where you can all of a sudden have the rules changed on you and someone can either shadow ban you or take it away. And so getting back to crypto and Ethereum, the dream for Ethereum is you can take a company like Uber, a network like social media, a banking payment system, whatever it is, build it on top of this protocol where it's got set rules that you know can't be changed unless the community changes them. And maybe that's a world in which another network presents itself on top of crypto and creates a utility case. So how does these networks, uh, social networks, not just say, hey, it's my platform, don't use it? They do. They do. No, I'm. I'm, I'm saying <laughs> that's why. They, what, that's why they're. If so the awesome. government, if the, the the Supreme Court is trying to hold them accountable for it, how is you know, the at, argument at, not at, just at don't point, use my at platform? At what point do they become public forums? Right. Yeah. They and, are 100 percent right, so, but it's still privately owned for the so, most part or whatever yeah. traded. They can still say it's just my platform. I'll give don't you an use it. So in in networks, tele, cellular networks, telephone systems, right you are not allowed to regulate content. They're called common carriers, right? That's something where we agree that nobody can exist in this world without being able to use a telephone, and so they're not allowed to regulate any content. There's an exception for them, right? Even universities, there's an exception where you're not really allowed to regulate content as a university. Anybody is supposed to be allowed to speak because it's considered like part of the public trust, part of the public square. Newspapers, you are allowed to regulate because it's editorial. So this is my viewpoint, right? Yeah. Social media falls in a place where you don't quite know if it's a newspaper or a oh, cellular okay. network, yeah. and it falls in this middle ground. So it's, and the minute they start using algorithms to suppress or promote speech, you could make an argument that it's more like a newspaper or an editorial platform, but at the same time, it's a public utility, right? Because you can't exist without having access. We, we asked you on one of these do you like social media? Do you not? Do you think it was good? You felt very strongly that social media was a good thing on the whole, right? I had a bit of a different opinion, but the fact is you're bound to their rules or you don't have a network to plug into. And and so there have been, been, I don't know, 10, 15 attempts at decentralized social media, right? This is kind of the utopian dream. The problem is the latest one's called Friend Tech. It was done on Coinbase's platform called Base. Pretty interesting. Uh, the problem is network effect, right? People get excited and then a week later, there's not enough people on it and you go right back to Twitter because everyone's on it or you go right to Facebook. And so it's just not ready yet. Uh, and maybe when, you know, in, in a year or two or if, if, if these other guys really become, uh, you know, either regulated out or, or people just get sick of them, right? A lot of people yeah. left Twitter. You can't leave Twitter if you're in crypto. Yeah. Like crypto lives on Twitter. Yeah. And so you want information, you want to understand what's going on, you got to be on Twitter. I, I want to say something else, right? Generally, when they've tried to solve this, like originally HTML, HTTP, that's like nonprofit, basically. It's a government, you know, you aren't going to be able to fight Facebook or Twitter as a nonprofit, right? Why crypto is so interesting, or Ethereum, is the tokenization that rewards early adopters, right? So I agree with Mike. It's been <laughs> impossible in 15 years. What? It's so, been impossible in 15 years to compete. I mean, you haven't seen you any of these. No, no, I'm laughing because we may all wake up tomorrow and business untitled and all that yeah. is going after exactly. this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it. But in, in, in a crypto scenario, you have an ability to create an ecosystem. Say we're all driving Ubers, right? We use the Uber token, but that happens to be built on Ethereum. And that utility drives the value. So whoever's in the system first gets more value, becomes a part of that ecosystem. And so it's not not for profit. It's just a different way of setting up a corporation. You know, you know what's interesting? When I first, 2014, I started talking about the promise of crypto. And my example was a company I called Duber. <laughs> decentralized Uber. And I had this whole token model and why it should work and how it theoretically could work. And I re- ran into the CEO of, of Uber, Travis, at one point. And the first meeting I had with him, he kind of brushed me off and like, oh, you're full of shit. And a couple of years later, I sat down with him, and actually spent two hours. He's a lovely guy. And when I sat there, I was like, oh my goodness, how naive I was. 
when I looked at what it took for him to create Uber, right? He bought the supply, he bought the demand, he smashed laws. He did a lot of things that only a world-class CEO who was a freaking maniac. Uh, Shout out to my friend Tara who helped him do that. <laughs> who, who, who could do to build it. And it doesn't mean it's impossible for communities to get together, right? The, the greatest example of a giant community doing something cool in crypto was Ethereum switched from one way of authenticating their blockchain called proof of work to proof of stake. It was an immense technological and organizational move that this decentralized community did. And so there's huge power in community. But there are some things that I, I wonder, like how you get them up and running. And then once they're up and running, they have such network power, it's hard to unseat them. And so, listen, I'm, I've got 450 employees. I come to work every day uh, trying to forward this crypto revolution. Um, I'm really introspective about what parts are going to soar and what parts are really going to need a momentum shift. And you know, there should be a lot more decentralized systems and we don't have them yet. What, what about, I mean, NFTs would seem to be the most logical place to build that, right? I'm saying OpenSea's already built on Ethereum effectively, right? Biggest marketplace. And there's, and, and right, you'd say like NFTs have a big use case. Forget about the speculation of like yep. silly art projects, yep. but yep. the provenance of digital goods. So maybe that's the place that a network there, gets and there, built. Listen, there, there are lots of good things happening. Sometimes, yeah. you know, revolutions happen in a short period of time and sometimes they happen in a longer period of time. What is clear to me is that the decentralized revolution is going to go slow, slow, slow until it's fast. Now, don't let me don't think I'm a, a pessimist. I'm so long Bitcoin is coming out my ears in Ethereum right now. Like Bitcoin as a store of value has already won. It's going higher, mm -hmm. right? Payment systems, right? Crypto for payments is exploding up and there's a lot of cool new projects coming on. And tokenization is coming, which means we're going to take things that you could imagine selling 10% of a sports team in tokenized form to people yeah. that was owned by private citizens. And all of a sudden, they're going to feel ownership. Um, so we're going to have – tokenization is another form of equity, right? We're going to have lots of part of the revolution. And as that's happening, my hope and my thought is – We'll get decentralized ticketing. Yeah. We'll get decentralized. What I'm saying is it just hasn't happened yet. Right. And it hasn't happened yet because it's really hard to beat these network effects. Yeah. What what happens is that this podcast, I really love this podcast, not just because it's us and it's business untitled shout out, but like I'm legit having anxiety thinking about the things we're talking about because it's so real and so true, right? Like I watched this movie come back from Dubai called The Creator. Have anyone seen that? Mm -mm. It's with uh, Denzel Washington's son. I can't forget his, forget his, I can't remember his name, but something Washington. He's actually a pretty good actor. And they lived in a world in 2065 where AI got so developed that AI lived amongst humans as almost the equivalent as humans. Everything was ran by AI. And what happened, AI set off a nuclear bomb and killed uh, one million people in Los Angeles. So the West decided we need to eliminate AI completely. The only place, strangely enough, that said we're going to keep AI was New Asia, right? This is a movie, by the way. But as we all know, right, a lot of things in movies we come to see really come to light. The, the Simpsons 10, 20 the, the, episodes. All over, all over the Internet two days ago was that a bunch of the – Tech billionaires have put a bunch of money and like six hundred million dollars to build uh, to build humans to build oh, robots. Build robot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That so was that, just yeah, that yeah. was just, and they were yeah, yeah. they were all the same guys we're talking about. So yeah, it gives me anxiety because yeah. I'm like, yo, are the things we talking about? Is it actually? Is it gonna come to light even more and more and more? Are we like we go back to AI right? When I was talking about, I was going to, I built a studio recently, right? right. Multi million dollar studio I built. But it was two purposes I built it. One was for music publishing because that's been such a big, 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 big income generating thing for since music exists. There's the songwriters, there's the producers, and, and there's the recording studio. So you had two aspects so you could make money. And one day, I think I told you that, I just was like, yo, I think this AI thing is going to be too big for songwriters and producers to compete with it. 
And one of the things that really stopped me was I saw a guy, Mike Karen, who gave me my first record deal, shout out to him, who owns the large, one of the largest publishing companies, APG. He invested and owns a company called Gens, which is the future of songwriting and music publishing and producing that literally you send it a text and it's you say, hey, I want a new version of Bitcoin to the moon. And it generates that for you. So I was like, man, I don't think I should spend what would cost me millions of dollars building a traditional publishing company because I'm so fearful that AI, which we've heard songs from The Weeknd, yeah. we've heard songs from Drake, mm -hmm. we've heard songs from a, a few, Taylor Swift, that was AI generated to their likeness almost to a T. A and there's no regulation that could stop that as of right now. On a much, much larger scale, uh, Tyler Perry just pulled the plug on his, I think it was $800 million uh, studio that he was building because he was like, oh my goodness, all these actors and actresses are going to become like AI bots. Uh, and he's just worried. That so, yeah, I'm worried. What you're talking about with uh, with the social uh, networks, it's all boiling back Listen, to I, one I, thing, I, I technology. Was, I was flying yeah. down uh, with a bunch of friends, uh, great investors, to, to Florida for our fantasy football closing dinner. And one of the guys who's one of the gurus of investing he was like dude you're still using chat gpt check out perplexity.ai and so we all flipped to perplexity tell you if you're out there and you're using chat gpt I'd, I'd flip to perplexity it is just smoother more sophisticated has instant data i've been asking it questions i asked it you know tell me what's exciting about the bitcoin etf within one second it gave me a paper and i was like this could be our research paper it almost felt like it stole my speech, uh, it, it's not perfect on everything, but on the Bitcoin ETF, it just nailed it. But it's nailed a ton of things. That's in one second. Well, and, and, and so this stuff is iterating so fast and getting so good. Every single person is going to need to figure out how AI, help, yeah. AI helps their business. Yeah. I, so, I, I think to your point, though, you're, you're talking about nothing, nothing can stop it. I mean, there's a big question out there around fair use, around the fact that these large language models are trained on all the songs that those artists did, all the movies, all the New York Times article, all the books, right? So they're basically taking all this information, training the machine on it, then spitting something out that slightly changed music, you know, or, or simulating a voice and saying, oh, this is original art now. So yeah, but, there's going to be a lot of litigation around yeah, this. Yeah, but that's right now, right? And I yeah. think when you listen to Elon Musk, who created, uh, it was one of the creators of Chat GPT or OpenAI or Fine whatever. Or, Grok. The, but okay, yeah. but you listen to him, and his whole thing was we need to slow down AI because yeah. it's going to take everything over. Right. So that's right now, right? Right now, it's pulling from every source, pulling from every song. But there's a concern that it gets smart enough that it no longer has to pull from these things and can create and can't be controlled. So. Yeah, you're kind what of saying two if, things. Yeah, I guess you're saying two things. I mean, there's definitely that risk. I mean, it's it's going to keep getting smarter, keep creating more things. The question is, do we make a legal, you know, make laws effectively that say, oh, you're not allowed to source the original material and then use that for the basis of your creativity. Like, it doesn't do it out of thin air. It does it because these are large, like, they take a ton of data, they look at it all, they discover patterns, and then they start spitting back stuff that that's and they original that. and they alert and they learn from that so it's, it's yeah. neural link is that could that be a solution in a real way no i don't think so uh -oh. i listen I, I listen i think the reality is ai is coming do we have what whatever is that the singularity well, in five years 10 years 15 years we won't know for a while right there's a lot of things that look like they're all like self-driving cars we thought were all going to happen fast and now it's like oh it's taking longer than we thought I learned something interesting. But I think it's going to happen eventually. So right? what was interesting, yeah. here, here's a fact to what I learned on that plane. Uh, shout out to hanging out with really smart guys because you learn a lot. Uh, he's, I said, why don't we have self-driving cars? He said, well, it's the fourth nine. I said, what do you mean? He said, in order for us to really feel comfortable, they don't have to be right 99% of the time. Yeah. They don't have to be right 99.9% .9 or 99.99 yeah. or 99.999. They need to be right 99.9999. And 
as you go further down, it gets that much harder because you don't have even that many uh, data points, right? Yeah. Elon, with all the 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 driver data he gets from collecting on, from Tesla, he has everyone's driving. When you come to that fourth nine, mm -hmm. there are not that many times the cat ran in front yeah. of the car at this level, and the, and so it's been much much harder than we thought. Uh, there's a, there's also there's and also so who knows when they get it, but we're not close. There's also a phenomenon where people really hate AI, right? And what's going on in San Francisco with was it Waymo or whatever that car they attacked was it yeah. Waymo? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, did you hear about this? There's no. A couple of weeks ago, one of those self-driving cars driving around San Francisco, Pete Mob attacked it, like beat it, you know, basically like flipped it over, turned it on fire, but it wasn't doing anything. It's just this visceral anger at humans being displaced you know and it's it's what you're saying in the music industry to bring it that there's real outrage by artists right like bad bunny someone tried to rip him off or whatever he's like this isn't my thing this is shit swear jar you know but it's there's a real visceral d dislike or uh, repulsion but listen from it. right this yeah. is the, the back to the music industry right and i think it was like 1950 actually it was 1959 the machine drum pattern was invented right which yeah. today is used by every producer, every yeah. songwriter. There's different versions of it where yeah. a kid now, yeah. and the, the yeah. fear was the drummers who made all the drums for every yeah. song till 1959, it was like, we're gonna be out of work, we're gonna this, that, that, yeah, yeah. which a lot of them were out of work. Some of them switched and started understanding it, but what happened, it created more drummers, more producers, more, yeah. a more efficient way to become better at producing, right? So that's, that's six, also a possibility. That's the $64,000 too. question. If you yeah. saw Jensen, Jensen, Jensen Wang, he gave oh, an amazing interview. Um, yeah. I saw that. Uh, where he was basically like, everyone thinks they got to run, become computer science programmers. He's like, yeah. no, 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 no. That's, that's happening for you. You need to learn how to use it in whatever you're doing. Yeah. Right? What that's are you going to ask this thing to do for you? Right. This is your yeah. this is your workforce. This yeah. is your computer science guy. And it was a weird mind switch shift because you would have thought, tell your kids, go study computer science. He's like, no, no, they missed that. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Study how you use AI, how you use this tool to change things. And so, yeah, we might see one of the great productivity booms in modern era. Right. It's the one thing that could save the U.S. economy. I was about to say you said that on uh, yeah. our last. Well, not our last one. Our podcast. What do you mean by that exactly? Can you break that down a little bit more? So what does productivity mean? If it used to no, take... No, no, no. I, I mean, yeah, that too, yeah. but you're saying if it AI used to take, can save if us. If it used to take us 10 hours to paint a room, right, the, the yeah. three of us, and now we can have a robot that really goes fast and paint it in 30 minutes, like that's a huge gain in productivity. Yes, like, it is a hundred percent. But then the three of us that used to be able to get paid for that are not out of work. Yeah. And what do we do? So, a if we own the company that paints, wow, are we making lots of money because we've yeah. fired our labor and 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 we've got more than likely we won't It'd be owned by one guy. <laughs> yeah. B if we're if we were people that used to work there, we've got all this time to do other things. Can we? And so what? <laughs> what no, what's that doesn't is, make any. What's that doesn't make any sense. What, what, well, one thing might it's still three people out of work. So one thing yeah. that might happen, and this is a reality, we already attempted universal basic income. Right after COVID happened, we gave everyone a whole lot of money. Say, hey, take some money. I don't think it's sustainable, but we did it. Like you could see a world where so much labor gets done by robots and machines. I, yeah, but that, but, but that but, we but end up the, just the only reason uh, that 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 just doesn't make any sense because. Yeah. If you see a world where a robot is eliminating jobs yeah. for pro productivity, which is saving the economy, this now that makes the richer and poor gap even I, wider. Right. It's really it hard, right? Because so it's no, really hard. I'm 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 never gonna own an AI company. Never say never. But it's really hard to see the rich Most people are gap. not. Wait, but wait. The most people. We should have yeah. an interrupting job. Yeah, we should. <laughs> most people are not going to own an AI company. Uh, what, what Sam Altman said it. I see a future where billion dollar companies are ran by one man, right? So be honest. If you had an AI right now that Galaxy would be able, and you know what? I know you, so you probably won't do it, but it doesn't mean somebody else won't do it. That you could fire all four, 500 employees, make 
your company 10 times more efficient and fucking another swear jar and make your company 10 times more efficient and it's just ran by you and AI. You, because I know who you are as a person, well, you probably won't do it, but most CEOs will. But so, what happens to that four or 500 people? So the, what happens what, to that workforce? What's happened all through history? When we, when we took the, you know, the guys who used to drive the horse and buggies and we got cars, they had to get new jobs. People are going to have to find new things to do. There won't what, be what, what you're saying I know, so what, to bring it as so simple so as I'm, painting. I know. So what I'm saying is. We're going to have a lot more. We're going to not work five days a week. We're going to work four days a week and then three days a week. We'll make can less I just, money. Can I just say, can I just call bullshit on that? Because that's absolute horseshit. Like, what's gone Wait, what's on, absolute what's, horseshit? This, this, what's on, gone on for the last 30 years, right, is wages stagnate. More money has gone into assets. The rich have gotten richer. Well, the I don't think that's, I, 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 and that's that, my and point. And that is just getting accentuated by this. So I, there's I, no I, I way disagree that. with that. So I, yeah. AI saves so us. Whole, how does that not... So happen the, times the whole, ten. The whole free time thing just doesn't work. It's just not what's going I, on. What, what, like what, what, what ends like, up what ends up happening though, when you get this this gap between rich and poor as wide as it is, and it's and it's in every chapter in in recorded history, it ends in revolution. Every single chapter when the rich so poor got, gap gets wide, it ends in revolution or a plague right. or something else that you know. A war. So then AI doesn't save the world if well, it ends in well, revolution, what, what, it destroys what it. What happens is though you get productivity, you start making more money. Some people up the gap between rich and poor gets wider and wider, and you might end up having new systems. Like we might need a whole new system. We might need universal basic income. They do it in Norway, and it works pretty well. Norway's five million people. I, I, I'm, it's not even a comparable I'm, state I'm not, to here. I'm not and, saying. Okay, I'm right, not you saying said I, your piece. I, you said your piece. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying like for now, for years and years, right? What's happened is the rich poor gap has been yes. right, has has gotten worse. The this system of capitalism needs adjustment. It's why I got back to blockchain before the tokenization, utility like creators and early adopters sharing right that is a new system at the end of the day you're talking about revolution well i hope it's not a revolution because that's gonna suck for everybody right so some new system has to be formed because if it's just like the techno manifesto of like andreessen or something like that that oh technology is good well we know that's not always the case social media look hasn't been good in so many ways and so if you're talking about ai all i'm saying is i know you really want to say something bad just one second <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm saying, like, <laughs> if you're talking about AI, you have to recognize that this dream of just productivity doesn't do anything for the common person at the end of the it day. It kills That's the common person. person. But again, yeah. again, He's saying it, they're going to find new uh, no, jobs. I'm, not, Where? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying there is an inevitability to it, and therefore we're going to have to figure out what to do with it. It is happening if you like it or not. No, I I, right? no, and I so, completely agree with you. Well, what I don't agree with is save, it, it's, it's saving America it's, it's, it could or save any our, country. It could save our uh, – uh, it, it could kill inflation, which helps this whole giant debt we have not crush us. We have less than half of America feeling good about themselves. Literally, right? You talk to the Walmart. The Walmart CEO came on uh, his earnings call. He said, the bottom half of our shoppers are spending less already. Question. And they're credit card debt. Uh, uh, and so, hold on, let me finish. Okay. Uh, and so we are on this trajectory, that, which will break at one point. It will break with revolution. It will break with something. The response might be UBI. The response might be just give people more money. The response might be... Uh, like put up gates around cities. I I, I don't know, wait, but, wait. but it, 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 we're 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 heading towards Blade Runner, the first version. Yeah, and I don't know what stops it. Okay, question. Wait, how many Walmart CEOs are One. there? One. One. Okay. Right. I, 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 <laughs> is that a trick question? No, it, it is a tr trick <laughs> question. There's one Walmart CEO. He doesn't make this shit work alone, right? How many Walmart employees, like basic general employees, you think they have? Two three, million. three million. Yeah. That they pay roughly. I'm, I'm making just guess. They pay yeah. Minimum wage. Fifteen bucks an hour. Yeah, I'm just saying like what a billion dollars. What? A billion dollars. A lot more than that. A lot more a than lot that. More. Yeah. So if they can pay, if I was a Walmart CEO, or let, you know, let me just speak for myself, if I own. Uh, a bunch of Bojangles, and I could save costs by by spending one year worth of salary to build. Of course you do. Yeah, we of all course do. You we, do. We know that. We're that's not, how the no system So that. That, that's yeah. what I'm saying. What happens to there's one CEO who benefits from it and the, the publicly okay. traded to, thing, but what listen, happens to those millions of employees? Listen, listen, listen. 
this is where another system this is where another system has to come into play okay there's no disagreement that the, the system of capitalism in fact of of our corporations is such that you must maximize for profitability essentially that's the rules the rules are you have the to Delaware maximize law says that you only must can care about that's no, right. no, no, i agree to, with that yeah, completely so, so i'm saying of course that's going to be the result right another system has to take hold that hopefully is not revolution and why i was going back to previously tokenization which i do think like is misunderstood it hasn't come on yet but it's not if you can't change the paradigm of how many people are owning the means of production right mm -hmm. without going to communism because we know that's a totally different non-working system and adjust capitalism so that there's a better way that the proceeds of early adopters early workers people that help build the value of the company can also be take some of that value in a gamified way which was what tokenization kind of does i mean there's there's an alternative i know it's a long way away from happening right now but technology itself will just keep uh, there, putting us into this there's rabbit a book hole. called the protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism which we i all, think that's what i was actually trying to say which broadly stated way back and this was probably written in geez 1700s um that capitalism works because we have religion when it was written it gives us some rules that doesn't allow us just to let capitalism run rampant right there is some moral revolution that is needed right ceos in europe get paid a whole lot less than ceos in america not because they're worse because the culture says we don't think it's fair uh right aristotle wrote the ceo shouldn't make more than 10 times yeah. what an average employee makes we have ceos making 600 700 times yeah. what an average employee. The, and so at one point like something's got to bend that's what politics is yeah. politics says these are the rules we're going to play by and if it's going to be if we're, we're going to smush social media companies if we're going to tax wealthy people at 90 percent in the 1970s the top right. marginal tax rate was 90 percent yeah, but no. there was a million tax shelters to I get agree. around, I it, agree. number one. And but number two, Europe is a calcified mess I agree. because it's basically a but socialist. I'm, I'm not arguing for yeah. any of these. I'm saying that these are the, these are the things we're going to run into. None of them work. Agreed. Yeah. I am very pessimistic. Uh, in the, right. unless, unless. That we're heading towards Blade Runner. But, but, but we're going to try some things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's, it is a, a needle to thread, and I think that. You know, we started this whole thing on blockchain because I think there's a lot of misinformation about what the utility of this, you know, forget about decentralized, like a new protocol where the rules are predictable, right? That's what I'm talking about, where yeah. it's not that Facebook or somebody, A, sucks all the value to the middle and B, can cut you off whenever they want, right? More akin to how websites were built. And I think there's got to be, you know, that's what I think is interesting about blockchain at the end of the day is that it sets up a system where maybe, just maybe, there's a way that early adopters, creators, right, that it's a flatter system and there's more wealth that's shared in that system effectively. If you, if, and if yeah, you, I, I, I just too, don't yeah, disagree. If yeah. you think about what Satoshi's great breakthrough was, Right. Satoshi created private property on the Internet for the first time. Mm -hmm. Before the Bitcoin white paper, there was no private property on the Internet. There is no capitalism without private property. Mm -hmm. right? George Washington said there yeah. is no freedom without private property. Right. right. And so this idea that you could have private property means we could attack these feudal like the, the Internet until Satoshi was feudal. And it was the lords of, you know, Facebook and Google. And we would well, sell our data. We get Still paid for is. it. We get paid for it. I know, I know but it's, it, it, and, and so the, the promise or the hope of crypto was like you could attack those walled gardens, those those feudal areas with other systems. I'm praying that still happens. It, it potentially helps, right? It helps creators. It helps artists. It helps coders. It helps so many things. Say, this is my this is my wealth. Yeah. It even things like with your DNA, right? Right now, you give your DNA, no one care. Like 23andMe took everyone's DNA. Uh, or Ancestry.com. You know, you kind of got fooled into giving your DNA. There could be a system where you give your DNA and it's protected and you get paid when they use it. Right. Like there are lots of ways to give value or money back to people. It's really hard to build those systems. They haven't been built yet. But something needs to happen or we're going to look, look like Blade Runner. I want to say this about 23andMe. I don't think a lot of people know this, but if you ever took 23andMe, <laughs> as cool as it was, you literally signed over your DNA to them. Yeah. You no longer same, own your DNA. Same thing with Ancestry.com. Same thing with them. 
I you know, know 23 and me bust. But anyway, Dave, you was talking about something earlier. Let's talk about real estate. You feel a little bit. It's like a cool, creative, I don't know if it's going to work, play that was happening that you was talking about with Ikea. Can you tell us about that? You know, there's been a lot of speculation around real estate, reuse of real estate. It's obviously been a very tough market, uh, particularly for commercial real estate, malls, office buildings. But um, I read today, which I thought was pretty cool, that Ikea was getting it has gotten into like owning the mall business they're pairing up with co-working kind of like i think it was industrious they were doing it but i just thought it was interesting where they're kind of remaking malls in a way because i was pretty pessimistic on most of these reuse things i think most of these malls are you know pretty hard to reuse and, and have lost their purpose. But I thought it was kind of an interesting article where they're pairing co-working services, things like gyms and um, uh, medical medical services, haircuts, things like that, along with co-working and limited retail food and beverage. But I just thought it was like a bright light, a bit of hope in like what's a pretty bleak you know, commercial real estate. I thought it was one of the market. coolest things. I, yeah. you, I don't know. You, no, as I, a I, developer, I, you think it could work? I do think it could work. Five, I think it's five years the, ago, they, I, mean, yeah. I remember them trying it with building apartments, and they were like, a, they were, were going to build little mini villages yeah. where they, there was going to be yeah. residential plus all that stuff. Yeah. So right. I don't think it works for residential. That's that's where I think this thing was interesting. Services. I think residential in a mall is a bad fit. Yeah. We've read a lot about I it, but they that. tend to sit off highways, right? They've got ramps and parking lots, and it's not a place you want to live. But for offices, it's different, you know? The office, it's like you go – if you think about suburban offices, I see they're, they're soulless bags of crap in the middle of these highways anyway. So might as well use a mall, which is meant for socializing, retail, a little bit of walking. I got it. I got so it. It, it makes sense to me in a way that it had – made sense before and I think Ikea's got the cred to pull it off because they got a, a healthy business they can anchor that mall with with a, you know a store some furniture they, they draw a lot of traffic so I thought it was it was one of the more interesting it, will it be robbing from Peter to, to pay Paul so like it becomes a much more vibrant suburban office park if you think about it and then the the, yeah. the old as you call bag of crap office building really then well I, well I think there's two things that come out of that if you're in the, look if you were in the suburban office market over the last 30 years, you got crushed. It was a shit place to be. Anybody that sold that made out because it's really been terrible because they're terrible assets. Um, yeah, it could pull from other office buildings. It could pull from the city even a little. But look, it's it's all about revitalization, reuse. You know, you, you got to go where the demand is. I thought it was just an interesting, creative way uh, to reuse. And it's the first one I've heard in a while that's not bad. Yeah, know? actually, I yeah. like it a lot. It's interesting. The only place where I've read about where there's like commercial coming back is San Fran because AI is bringing all this talent back to, you know, the four biggest AI companies in the world are based in San Fran. And so as much as everyone hated San Fran for a while because there's poop on the streets and, you know, <laughs> they're coming back. And yeah. so the, the office building market is coming back. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing it come back anywhere else? I'm not. You know, I don't have a lot of office exposure. I don't think it's coming back. I think it's stabilized off the bottom, if I would say, in places like, particularly like New York and San Francisco, because they're always supply constrained to some degree, right? right. I think the Sun Belt markets are even worse. I mean, people talk about Austin and Dallas, and they're great markets, but they got a lot of office space, a lot of vacancy. Um, but uh, uh, to be fair, I haven't seen. It. I think it's off the bottom. That's what it I still could be a shoe to drop on the economy that this yeah. we haven't dealt with this. You know, offices literally. So I was reading some stories. Yeah. Things are trading at twenty cents on the dollar yeah. over they were six years ago. And so whoever yeah. lent that money is uh, SOL. Yeah, because offices have a double problem, right? Residential, at least you have strong rents for the most part. Yeah, they've come off a little bit lately, but you have more offices. You have rents that have been declining, big vacancies, and you got mortgage rates through the roof. Um, no buyers. Everybody's sitting on the sidelines. So it's kind of like a perfect storm in office and. In general, in real estate, until we get a little more clarity on where the ten year is heading, right? It's gonna it's gonna take a minute to shake out. Where's the ten year gonna be in two years? <clears throat> <laughs> I've been short and losing. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The economy is slowing, but it's kind of bucking around, and it's probably around five percent in two years. You think the ten year is going up to five percent? Yeah. You think it's going the, up because the curve the curve will steepen, right? Yeah. 
I don't maybe four percent in ten years. Four, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that this government can survive with a five year five, with a five percent ten year with all the debt that they have out there. It feels to me like they have to figure out a way to push it down. But when they start pushing the front down, the back comes up a little bit, right? It's just interesting. Yeah, maybe, yeah, the curve, maybe, the yeah. curve is, is is abnormally flat. Oh, I agree. I think I think short terms have to go down, and so that normally pressures the back. Let's end on something fun. Uh, when I was <laughs> slaving away here in New York, you guys were in the Middle East and just got back. Impressions of Dubai, impressions of that whole part of the world. Uh, we're moving to Dubai uh, <laughs> next week. <laughs> We got uh, a new guy to like replace you on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out yeah. Oliver Ripley or Larry Morrow. <laughs> no, I, I thought Dubai was a, was was amazing. I thought, I mean, I've been there many times over the years, but like every time I go back, it's better. This time, it was just off the hook. It had a palpable energy. It was just moving. There was people from all different countries, all different places. It was just hopping. I mean, uh, like we had New we had, York in the. It 80s, was like New York 90s. in the eighties or nineties. We had our friend Larry Morrow with us. Shout out to Larry Morrow. He's the best. And uh, he was like, "Man, this feels like the future. This is amazing. Like it was just such an energy you couldn't couldn't get over it." So, it's, so interesting. It's like interesting. five years, seven years ago, you go to Dubai and you'd be like. Okay, one day is good. Yeah, two days. Two days a lot. It's almost like Vegas. Yeah, I think it's but still like for me, it's probably still like a four day thing max, and then you want to go to fuck home. But it was it was really nice. But I think for me, one of the best parts of it was going to Qatar. I've never been to Qatar before, and I think what happens when you travel, you get to meet such dope people, and it brings you back to like rich, poor, whatever. You get to realize, wow, and you always say it. That rich guy or that person from Qatar or that person from China or that person from, they take a shit on the same toilet I take a shit on. And you get to realize, man, these people are just as dope as people you may meet in America. And you may meet some bad ones. You may meet some good ones. But it's still just people, you know. And I think that was like such a dope lesson for me. Not a lesson in a sense, but it was so dope to meet some dope people in a part of the world that, you know, I have never got a chance to and realize I met a really a, 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 a lot of dope people out there in Qatar. And it was just We're going to really start cool finding if you use the word dope one more time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to. It's so funny, right? We're, 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 we're 17 minutes in now, right? He wanted to. And I, I, I have a dinner. I got to go. I got to go. But every time he wanted to interrupt you and continue to go, his time <laughs> got more flexible. I, I asked about the place you were, I was sitting here grinding no, no. away. That was his, bro, he's so smart, and that's why I love him. He's wickedly <laughs> smart. He knew, he interrupted, and like, uh, so he wanted to just lessen the load. How was your trip, guys, now that I've already manipulated you into speaking <laughs> <laughs> for seven more minutes of my time? You got to go, Mr. Novogratz? Hey, it's been a great episode of Business <laughs> Untitled. Uh, we'll be back soon. And uh, we got some really cool guests coming. We do. We've got the guests. We're going to start rolling the guests in again, but we just like talking ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Peace out. Peace. Out. Peace.